to try to delve deeper into the question of what is the meaning of my life at this moment maybe might help us mitigate the damaging effects of setting expectations. You're listening to Good Is In The Details. I'm Gwendolyn Dolsky. And I'm Rudy Sallow. And this is the podcast where we learn what we didn't know we didn't know in the spirit of Socrates, all with an effort for a self-improved life, a healthier life. And we're learning more about the good life in this episode with Rabbi Mark. It's good. I like it. Stick with that. <laughs> okay, perfect. Our last episode of 2022, I'm so glad that we're signing off this way. We learned so much about the wisdom in scripture, some great stories, and what does it mean to, yes, live a meaningful life? Rudy, there were a couple of surprises. I think something that you and I both learned that we didn't know before, and that that is in Judaism, this is not the only world that was created by God. Right. Yeah, I don't I know. I don't know if it's that. Uh, yeah, you didn't get that wrong. I did seize upon something that the rabbi was, uh, said, and I seized upon it, and of course, immediately went to my crazy place and just asked them very professionally about Judaism's belief in aliens and, and whether or not that would impact their belief in God. And we learned. I mean, he was very clear. He gave a very clear answer. It was not a. Well, you know, there's this fact that it was like, well, in Judaism, it's totally fine. But I do understand in certain Christian sects that that could have an impact. It was fantastic. And and it was not, um, it was taken very seriously because it was a very serious question. And there was a lot of great questions that were raised. I seized upon another word and phrase that the rabbi was saying about having personal expectations and tempering yes. personal expectations. That's something that I'm really trying to focus on. In 2023, dare I say, top of Rudy's New Year's resolutions is to dial back my expectations. And we talk about that on this show. We learn about what is faith. One of the things that stood out to me, so I'll just kind of tease this, is what is a phrase that can be said to somebody who is happy, that can kind of bring them to the present, or somebody who is very sad or upset that can bring them to the present? It's one phrase. And that was one of my favorite parts of this episode. I've actually mentioned it to so many people over the holiday. Yeah, I'm happy that we're going to be releasing this still in the holiday season. Yes. This is the last show of 2022. Thank you all listeners throughout the world for helping Good is in the Details progress towards the great podcast that we have. Please, if you haven't done already, write a review. We just recently found out we're in the top 20% of all podcasts that are shared via Spotify. That was a that was wonderful news. Globally. Globally. And so we love our international folks. Thank you so much. I think you guys are going to love this episode. We'll hope to see you more of you in 2023. Yes. So we're finishing up 2022 with Rabbi Mark about the good life. I'm trying to think of what my first question would be off the bat. Well, how about a question that I'm sure we would ask somebody who was also of other cloths? I mean, I'm always fascinated by this question, and I hope this isn't inappropriate, but why'd you become a rabbi? Let's start with that. We'll do an easy one. How about why did you become a rabbi? And then what is the meaning of life? Two, we'll just start out two easy questions. <laughs> yeah. Let's put the man on the spot right there. So, somehow he looks smart enough to link the two together, though. I, uh, I've got a lot of faith in Rabbi Mark. Rabbi Mark, why did you become Rabbi Mark? Thank you. Um, yes, thank you for the, the faith. And thank you and good morning. Um, so my journey to the rabbinate was a very circuitous one. I did not know what I wanted to be when I was growing up, <clears throat> when I entered college uh, in the, uh, when did I enter college? Oh God, in the late 70s. Um, I did not know what my major... Don't mean to inter don't don't mean to interrupt you, but thank God you did not pick lawyer because you have no <laughs> idea how many times I hear from people, well, I don't know what I wanted to be, so I became a lawyer. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, no, that's quite all right. Um, although I did dabble in law for a while uh, and took several courses, I was fascinated by it. I knew that I did not want to be a lawyer. No, no offense to the profession. I find, especially with Jewish law, a lot of similarities and some deep fascination on my own part. And so I ended up graduating from The Ohio State University with a degree in public relations but wasn't sure still what I wanted to do with that. This was in the 80s. As a matter of fact, it was 1982 when my wife and I graduated. The economy was not doing very well. And uh, we sold the car. The lease was up on the apartment. And we spent two months, uh, sorry, we spent two months backpacking through Europe. 
on our way to Israel to spend some time living on a kibbutz. It was our gap year, I guess, so to speak, uh, although it was after we graduated. And I was obviously during the time on the kibbutz in Israel that seeds started to sprout. I uh, came back home, picked up a job in a restaurant because uh, I had been working in a restaurant before, but knew that I didn't want to do that either. And so one day, literally just sat with my pad and started thinking about what was important to me. And I wrote some things that surprised me. I wrote down that Judaism was important to me. And I'm going, well, you know, other than Israel and I identifying as a Jew and being a Jew, I really hadn't done that much with Judaism. I wrote down, you know, that I wanted to have a family, that I was looking for more of a career and not just a nine to five job. Uh, I ended up dabbling. Maybe I need to be a social worker. Yeah, I definitely want to work with people. And one thing led to another. And by the end of the day, I realized I wanted to be a rabbi met with a rabbi that I grew up with, asked him what life is like and said, yeah, this is what I want to do. I realized my trajectory had been on a path of service. I had been working in a restaurant, uh, service to others, knowing that I wanted to go much deeper than that and ended up realizing that I wanted to dedicate my life to the Jewish people through the congregational life and through chaplaincy. And as for tying that into the meaning of life, I think it deals with us trying to find our our calling. We Jews don't, and rabbis don't like to speak of it as a, as a call, as you often hear within the Christian world. But there was an inner passion that was pulling me in that direction to want to spend the years necessary for continued study to become a rabbi. And so it was about finding ways to give back uh, for me that led me into the rabbinate. And, and here I am. Yeah. I find, you know, we get caught up so much and December can be, even though it's a big celebratory month, it can also be very hard. And I think that religious teaching can kind of bring us home in a way, can kind of center us. What is something that you find that people in particular need during this time of year? This is going to be our last episode of the year. So what is it that Um, yeah, that that you think that people need or that they need to hear or the kind of comfort or the kind of joy or the kind of love? What is going on in people's lives right now? I think the hardest thing about holidays are to deal with our our expectations. And uh, unfortunately, some of the falsely imposed expectations through media and Hollywood and movies as to what the holidays are supposed to be. There is the image of, you know, the the Brady Bunch and Ozzie and Harriet and all of those television shows and the, the winter specials, the Christmas specials, even Charlie Brown's Christmas special, where, you know, everything flows very nicely and there's no drama and there's no tension and everybody has a good time. And the reality is, is that as human beings... We are very messy. We are very messy in our lives. We are very complex beings. And what we've been presented is uh, a rather two-dimensional experience when we live in three dimensions. I think the hardest, the biggest challenge about approaching the holidays, and this is true for, you know, our holidays of of Passover, of Hanukkah, uh, of even the fall major holidays within Judaism, is the expectation that this is, you know, that this is going to turn out a particular way, like it's been scripted for us. And life is not scripted. We come into these holidays with certain expectations and then become disappointed because those expectations aren't met, uh, where I think the challenge is in where we set those expectations. There's going to be tension. That's That happens when two people come together. You know, my wife and I have tension in our lives. Fortunately, it's, it's, it's very manageable tension. You know, sometimes it's as simple as, well, I went Chinese tonight food for dinner and, well, I, I was feeling more Italian, you know. And so there's, there's tension there. And there's tension whenever we bring people together. And so I think one of the things that we have to acknowledge as human beings is that life is beyond our control. We can't control how the party is going to go. We can't control who's going to say what. We can't script this like it was a Hollywood session. Instead, this is more of a night at the improv. And we have to find ways to, instead of looking to control the moment, to just be in the moment, which is often the most difficult thing for us to do. We're either busy planning for what we're going to say next or what we're going to do next, or we get distracted by our phones and our text to just be in the moment and to recognize the fact that, you know, especially after the pandemic, when we all had great challenges in being present with each other, here we are coming together with people who are part of, who are part of me. 
and to think about the journey of the lives of those who preceded us that enabled me to be with my sisters. I mean, you know, going back to my great, great grandparents who on one side of the family, because a lot of those records are lost, I don't know who they are. But they obviously met in this whole chain of transmission of family uh, genetic code, so to speak, that has enabled me to be with my parents. Uh, I mean, if we think about the odds of us existing as a single individual, the millions of sperm, why that one sperm that got through to why that one particular egg? If we think about all the interventions that could have happened and the way that things could have turned out differently, it's a miracle we're here at all. That I exist as as an individual with me given what could have been. So there's great magistry and mystery in that. And sometimes just even acknowledging that we're able to be together as as family and as friends, that this is what has you know enabled us to be here at this moment, the history behind us. That's kind of miraculous. Rabbi, I'm so glad that you brought up from the, from the commencement of that discussion uh, something that I'm personally obsessed with, and I, and I hope you don't mind humoring me for a little bit here, but you spoke of the word expectations. And I have been studying my own self. Try, I mean, I'm on the show to try to make myself a better person. And I feel like the root of a lot of my own heartache are expectations. Now that's an oft misquoted quote of William Shakespeare um, said something different from a play. Uh, The play was uh, all's well that ends well. It's a completely different quote, but most people say, oh, William Shakespeare said that the root of all heartache is expectation. Now what I'm struggling with there is, you know, there's, okay, is it that I have, is it that we uh, during the holidays or in our daily life that our expectations are too high Or do we think, well, I wouldn't have done things that way, or I would have returned that phone call, or I would have done this. And so we're kind of, we're like matching human beings against ourselves. And therefore we are setting ourselves up for disaster by having these expectations. I'm just curious, like, what are your thoughts on expectations and how can we, I don't want to say lower them, but deal with them. I mean, I'm sure you probably have some wisdom on this subject. Uh, I, I only hope I do. Um, I think part of our expect part of our setting expectations is part of modern humans desire to either control uh, or to be prepared for a particular situation. Thousands of years ago, uh, there was so much that was absolutely beyond our control that we lived with truly a sense of, well, anything can happen at any moment. You know, diseases we didn't have cures for, the medical technology of, you know, 100 years ago, but let's go back 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago was was such that, you know, uh, who knew if you were going to be alive the next day? And so with that uncertainty came a sense of, I need to do the best job I can this day, today, now, because I don't know if I will be here. I don't know if I'll wake up in the morning. Our stability in modern life, the ability for us to find, I mean, just even in regards to this pandemic and the vaccination that we were able to develop so quickly to minimize these symptoms. This is incredible stuff. You know, this is, this is magic for, you know, a hundred years ago. There's no way anybody could have ever come up with this. Well, that has sort of instilled with us, I think, a sense of stability and control that, that, I can control life, that I can continue to uh, do what I do, and I will be here tomorrow, and I will be here five years from now, and I will be here 10 years from now, when the reality is, is that there, there are no guarantees. Part of our setting expectations for what we want out of this coming event is maybe our desire to control or our desire to be prepared for, instead of just going in. Uh, and and being in the moment, to find a way to live in the moment. That's a difficult challenge because we want to, part of us wants to be superior to those around us. Part of us wants to be prepared for the comeback, you know, ready for the response. None of us like to appear vulnerable. But I think if anything, looking back at the growth of Judaism and of Christianity and of Islam, we all come out of a time of incredible vulnerability and found a way to find faith and hope that tomorrow would be better. And with that hope and faith, 
find a way to deal with whatever the challenges were that we were facing at that time. And I think we've, we've lost some of that faith and hope that tomorrow will be better. I think we have become cynical simply because we, are, we know practically everything that's going on in the world around us. Thanks to the internet and our news feeds, back in the day, ignorance may have been a little bliss. I didn't realize that the country next to me was having a war or a drought. I didn't realize that, you know, halfway around the world, there was a volcano exploding. Uh, I didn't realize there were wildfires burning down people's homes. And now that I know all these things, it's overwhelming and it's easy for me to become cynical of life and cynical of uh, of what's going on around me. Yeah, I we you know we touched upon the philosophy of making yourself more knowledgeable, you know, that one of the tenets of philosophy versus well choosing to be ignorant. Like ignorance is bliss, you know, cuz maybe that's another philosophy too. It's just kind of and you you touched upon that where like well these days I don't, you you might not even be able to choose ignorance is bliss because there's just so much information out there, even if you chose not to listen to it uh, or to turn it off and that can change you. It, let's say you're not cynical, but like you just, you know, I, let's say you just wanted to lower your expectations of people because people just keep letting you down. What kind of advice would you give? So I think the, the truly amazing thing about us human beings is that we carry with us a whole bunch of tools in our toolbox. I'd like to go to this analogy, our tools in our toolbox. But oftentimes we get used to, you know, if your only tool is a hammer, then everything you see is a nail and you react out of a certain way. Part of our challenge as, a, as human beings is to load up our toolboxes with more tools, tools like uh, resiliency, tools like optimism, tools like gratitude, more tools. The more tools we have in our toolbox to respond to the problems or the challenges that we are facing, the better our response will be. In Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meeting, who writes about his experience surviving Auschwitz, noticing how human beings responded during that time, where some human beings in the camp shared their truly meager, meager amounts of food with someone else, and others became very uh, selfish or self-centered. Others became cruel. Some became more compassionate even at a time of tremendous cruelty. Some chose suicide. Some, some chose to do everything they could to try to survive that ordeal. And in his book, Viktor Frankl notes that when we human beings have a why, we can survive anyhow, whatever it is that we are facing. If, if we understand our meaning uh, and for Viktor Frankl, this was very individualized. Each one of us would have to come up and figure out our meaning. And it might be the meaning just in that moment. Uh, and then applying that meaning, why am I here? This is a call that Elijah hears in our Bible. He has just witnessed a cruel king who has decided to decimate all of his opponents, murdering people right and left, including other prophets. Elijah heads to the hills to hide for safety, perhaps, or overwhelmed by the pain of that moment. And there in the mountain, Elijah experiences God. Uh, first, there is a, a wind that is shattering rock, but God was not in the wind. Then there was a, a, an earthquake that, that shook the mountain to the foundation, but God was not in the earthquake. Then there was a fire, but God was not in the fire. And in the end, Elijah hears a soft murmuring voice, which says, why are you here, Elijah? You know, why are you hiding out here? This is not where you should be. And with that, Elijah goes back and challenges the king. I think, why are we here? What is the meaning to my existence is the biggest challenge we have that will require all of our tools in our toolbox. Why am I here? If it's a holiday gathering, why, why am I here? What, what is my purpose? What, what is the meaning of my existence here at this moment? It might be just to reconnect with family. It might be to be there to hear the pain of, of another, to listen. It might be to celebrate. And so to find, to try to delve deeper into the question of what, what is the meaning of my life at this moment, maybe might help us mitigate the damaging effects of setting expectations. You know, we just, we, we gather every year. My parents are fortunately still alive. They're in their 80s. We go to Florida 
And, you know, I have two sisters and they have their kids and I've got my kids and everybody's coming and we gather together. And we're from all walks of life, uh, literally. We have Jews married to Italians. We've got, my family is a United Nations family. My sister married an Iranian man. My niece and nephew are Iranian. Well, they're American, but of Iranian descent. This is an incredibly mixed gathering. And the meaning behind our gathering is just to have fun. That's the expectation. That's the only expectation that we try to spread in the messages. We send out, okay, here's where we're meeting. This is what's up. And to just watch them have fun, to laugh and to giggle, to watch these nieces and nephews, my nieces and nephews, their cousins gathered together. The meaning of this is, oh my God, look how diverse life really is. And look how much fun we can all have when we just want to just be together. You may have answered my question when I was thinking, um, when you're talking about Elijah, I think that the pre-Socratic philosopher Heraclitus, who said you can never step in the same river twice, I think that that applies to books. So one of my favorite pieces of literature is The Trial of Socrates. And it doesn't matter how many times I read it, I am not the same and the world is not the same. So I get something different out of it. And then when I teach it, my students are different. I am wondering if there is a passage or something for you that over the years has stuck with you. And as the world changes, as you change, as your children change, is there something that stands out to you that's just been meaningful, that's stuck to you, and it kind of withstands the test of time? And it, as time passes, it makes you rethink differently, you know, rethink the passage? So there are, there are several that come to mind. One of them comes from the book of Deuteronomy. We read this during Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, for us in the Jewish calendar. And the verse says that God has set before us the blessing and the curse. Uvecharta bechayim, choose life, says the Torah. Why does it say to choose life, our rabbis ask in their commentary? Because we are ultimately free to choose either way. We can choose life or we can choose death. Uh, That human beings have been endowed with free will. And therefore, it is ultimately our choice. And so choose life is the commandment, is the imperative uh, to choose life. Well, what does that mean to me to choose life? You know, if I am angry with my father because of his political views, <laughs> which, which we have been, uh, how do I choose life at that moment? I choose life by not discussing politics with my father. I love my father. He's my father. We disagree about politics. That doesn't mean he's any less of my father or less of a human being. Uh, But because we disagreed about politics, okay, I'm going to choose life and I'm not going to talk about politics with my father. Why? Because it's only going to make me angry and it's only going to make him angry. And so to choose life in whatever ways that means um, uh, to, to help me sort of frame this moment. I am going to do the best I can to be the source of of life and peace and light and love in these moments because I can choose death. You know, I can choose to argue with people. I can choose to uh, belittle others people. I could choose death, but my, my tradition compels me and commands me to choose life. The other one, the other phrase is uh, there's, there's a story that goes with this. King Solomon is looking for the, the most powerful phrase uh, in the entire world. Uh, I want to have a phrase that will make a you know laughing man cry and a crying man laugh. I want to know the perfect expression that I can apply that will, will change another human being's feelings. He sends out scholars and messengers and everything, and he's wandering around, uh, and he hears of somebody who knows of such a phrase. So he meets with this individual who's a farmer, just a peasant farmer, and uh, Solomon spends some time with him. And in the end, you know, the man says, look, this is a very powerful phrase. I'm just not going to share it with anybody. I want to know why it is that you want to know this phrase. Uh, and Solomon tells the man that not only is it about you know, being able to be of help to others, but something that would enable him as the king to always have the proper perspective when dealing with whatever issue he was dealing with. And the man says, because you have made this part of your personal outlook, I will share with you the phrase. And the phrase is, Solomon stops him and says, I want to see the phrase in action before you tell me. So they go to a nearby inn 
there's people all over the place and Solomon's observing and the old man, the farmer says, okay, so see that man, uh, there's a man over there who's laughing hysterically. Watch this. And the man goes up to the man and whispers into his ear. And the man, (laughs) and starts to cry. Somewhere over in the corner, there was a very sad uh, gathering of people. They, they had lost a dear friend. They were all mourning. They were, they were very silent and very somber. The old farmer goes up to the people and whispers to them a phrase. <laughs> the somber begins to turn to joy. Solomon's convinced. Okay, what's the phrase? Uh, and the phrase is, this too shall pass. And so choosing life helps me gain some perspective and helps me center myself at times when I am angry. Okay, why am I angry? Well, I'm angry because of whatever is going on in this moment. I try to remember this phrase to take a deep breath before I react so that I can try to respond instead of just reacting out of my anger so that I can respond with something or just to ignore it and move on. And this too shall pass. It helps mitigate those, those extremes of extreme joy and of extreme sorrow and sadness. This too shall pass. I knew the pandemic would pass. I knew that eventually we would emerge from this. But during those deepest, darkest days when everything was shut down and I was tired of streaming Netflix and I was tired of streaming this and tired of reading, you know, and going for a walk with my dog. Yeah, absolutely. Those two phrases helped me mitigate that that unprecedented time. What is a truth that is in Judaism? So something that, you know, despite, despite culture, despite time, that there's something that is just always remained true. Um, there are, there are many truths within Judaism. Um, I guess I'm thinking, so let me, let me back up. I'm just thinking one of my, one of my good friends um, from graduate school, Anya Topolsky, Anya, if you're listening, she and I were having a conversation. We really bonded. We both over the philosopher Hannah Arendt, we both loved Hannah Arendt. And I remember one time Anya was talking about just religious texts in general, um, I think in Judaism, and she was saying, a lot of these rules are to keep you alive. And I had never, I've never been able to get that out of my head, that a lot of the wisdom from the ancient texts, where some of the rules might seem arbitrary now, they're actually designed to keep you alive. And that even our concept of rightness or wrongness has to do with self-preservation and the way that we take care of our community and our neighbors, that I am now looking at rules differently. And so it seems like some of the things that have come and gone that don't seem as necessary in, let's say, in some sort of religious tradition, it's because they're not serving that purpose anymore. Like I'm thinking about, you know, in Catholicism, the old rule, no meat on Fridays, then all of a sudden, like that just kind of, that's you're going to be fine. <laughs> you're not going to end up in purgatory for that one anymore. But that's something that has rude airy thinking. <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm just thinking about all the other uh, the reasons. Yeah, why I'm going to be in purgatory <laughs> that's that's not that's not the one that's going to bring me there. But I might be there. But the, some of these some of these things, some of these traditions that have come and gone. But some central truths. I know in the in the works of Gandhi, he studied religions and he talked about a universal central concept of love that came from all of them. What is some Something that you would say is like it is just remains truth, and it actually brings some kind of peace, calmness, and that's particular to Judaism. I'm, I'm wondering, like, let me add to that question if you don't mind. To somebody who doesn't know much about religion or Judaism in particular, is there something that would maybe surprise them or interest them that is unique? Mm-hmm. Judaism teaches us that God created human beings to be partners with God in the process of creation. But Judaism also teaches that God has set a boundary across which God is not going to cross, that God would be identified as a a very differentiated being as opposed to an enmeshed being. So uh, Judaism starts with uh, the Torah, the five books of Moses, includes what Christians call the Old Testament. We call it Jewish scripture. And then for 700 years, uh, layers of commentary that are comprised in the Talmud. In the Talmud, the rabbis present the following, that God is busy creating and destroying other worlds before creating this world. Contrary to the mistranslation of the opening of the Bible, it is not in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, but rather when 
God began to create the heavens and the earth. In other words, the universe did not begin with this planet or this solar system. In each of the other worlds that God was busy creating and destroying before creating this one, which of course we know through science that everything that exists in this earth has come from stars that exploded billions of years ago and their gases and their remnants coalesced into this planet. These other worlds that God was creating were experiments where God was intimately involved in everything and, and you know, stopping the flood and stopping the fire and realizing the more that God intervened, the worse things became. And so in creating this world, the goal was that this world and this universe would evolve this is based on one of my favorite mystics, Isaac Gloria, that the universe, just as human beings are endowed with free will, okay, God could not stop Adam and Eve from eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Our rabbis in their commentary ask, when the serpent offers it to the Eve, why doesn't God say, no, I said don't, because God can't stop human beings from making choices. God can't force us to choose good. God can't stop us from choosing evil. With that as a foundation, not only are human beings endowed with free will and the freedom to make choices, but the universe is as well. There are laws of physics in place. One might say maybe that's what God created. Isaac Luria teaches us that God desired this free will rather than perfection. So there's a boundary that God's not going to cross. And if you read scripture, God doesn't do anything by God's self. There's always a human actor involved, whether it is Noah who has to gather the animals and to build the ark, or Moses and Aaron who have to confront Pharaoh. There is a human being involved. God doesn't do diddly squat. What this teaches us is that, and of course it challenges us then to how to uh, understand the miracles that are reported in our scripture, which I find are very easily explained. Scripture was oral for a very, very long time. And the degree of, you know, what is your proof uh, was not evident, nor was that part of the way we wrote stories or talked about things. The Bible was never written to be a history book. The Bible was written to be a book with morals and lessons, and it involves myth, and it involves analogies and all of these things. I am not one who is bound to the literalness of scripture because this is written by my ancestors as they tried to figure life out. God's word is in there, but I have to dig through to find it. So for one of the things that comes out of this, I guess would be the way our rabbis phrase it, pray as if everything depended upon God, but act as if everything depended upon you. So there's a realization there that God isn't going to do things for us because God has given us all the tools we need. Everything we need to know, we have. Now it's up to us. God says to Adam and Eve, while we're living in the Garden of Eden, in our pristine state of existence, God says to Adam and Eve, till and tend my world. Even here, you've got to prune the trees, you've got to rake up the leaves, you've got to cut the grass. You've got to do things in this world to make it a better place. And that's our job description as a human being. Rabbi, I, I hope you don't mind this question. It, it is a serious one. I really do mean this. And it's something that I am focused on religiously. And since you touched upon your discussion about the creation of our world, but before God decided to create our world, he created many other worlds. And, and you also said that God is always doing things. It's always God and humans together. Is this a very serious question because they're... <clears throat> Really, I believe me. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to belittle or do anything. There's a report that's supposed to come down in the next week or, or day or so about the United States government whether or not it's been hiding the existence of UFOs and aliens. I just put the, put that aside. But the relevancy of this question is because this was in the Wall Street Journal yesterday. I take the position that should there should we actually find the existence of aliens that that would shatter our religious tenets, um, whether that be Judaism, Christianity, Islam, I don't know if the world can handle it. Since you are an actual, you know, practicing rabbi, am I nuts to think that? Or, or can, or I mean, the way you talked about the, the creation of other worlds and everything, it actually made me think for a second. I was like, huh, wait, that, that makes sense. Like, 
that actually allows for the existence of other civilizations out there. Believe me when I say this is a serious question. By the way, I'm deathly afraid of aliens. So, so that, that that's a, it's a little that is she makes fun of me all the time about it. But but seriously, I really really want to know. Thank you, Ridley Scott. Um, <laughs> that was the good movie one. Aliens, good one. yes. For Jews and for Judaism, there's there's no issue. If there's life on another planet, great, you know, no big deal. It doesn't matter as far as Jews and Judaism goes, because we're on this planet and we're supposed to do what we can to make this place a better place. Christianity, I think some branches of Christianity may have some difficulties with that. Although Jesus was missing for 40 years, so maybe he was on other planets. I don't know. I don't mean to be making... You mean 40 days? 40, no, you mean 40, 40 days. years. Um, In the Bible, he's just years. a little kid, and then he grows up, and he's like 30-some-odd years old. Right. Oh, he wasn't. He was, he was, he was, he was partying with his friends. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I, That's what I'm missing. Growing his guy. <laughs> Wait, yeah, that's how he got the Birkenstocks and the, the beard and the hair. Sorry, go ahead. Didn't mean right. to interrupt. So, um, you know, for Jews, it doesn't matter. I would like to think there was life out uh, in the universe. I'm a big Trekkie, you know, uh, so (laughs) I have no qualms about that, and, and nor does it belittle my faith or our existence. If there is intelligent life out there in the universe, my challenge is trying to figure out why they would ever waste time with us. (laughs) Um, from the standpoint of some of the universal truths that are common to all religions, well, to at least monotheism, is, you know, love of neighbor. (laughs) We can't even show that, let alone accept responsibility for what we are doing to this planet. And so if there is intelligent life out there who's figured a way to travel faster than light to be here, I would think perhaps they might be here to study our stupidity. Um, and and how absolutely ridiculous we are. You know, 99.9% of our DNA across this planet for human beings is identical, identical. And so we can even rise above our tribalism from, you know, a thousand years ago. I don't mean to get controversial, Rabbi, but this is not me. I'm not arguing this, but some people would argue that it is because of religion that, the, that we cannot get along. What, do you, what would you say to that? Uh, without a doubt, comp- well, it, it's not so much the religion, but rather what people have done with that religion. I agree. That, yeah, used it for their own. Yep, absolutely. Okay. It yep. is the competition that enters into the arena, which might just be part of our human nature, where, you know, well, you can't have the only way to God. We've got a way to God, too. And, well, but that way's not the right way. And, you know, really? Um, yeah. And so it is how we have used religion over the span of our histories that has caused tremendous grief without a doubt, without a doubt. I know Anne Lamont, the, Anne Anne Lamont, she's the, she's a Christian writer and she said, I think faith is like a mountain. There's several ways to get up it. I always thought that was really beautiful. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. I, I, I'm with you, Rabbi. If there are any aliens out there, (laughs) they'd be, they'd best pass, pass along us. Just let us deal with our crap and maybe come back in a billion years, you know. And, and, and right. I'm with and, you. And see maybe if they saw Trump's digital trading cards. I don't know. Never I mind. Mean, sorry. Well, I'll just leave that. That big announcement. I'm sorry. That was one of the funniest things. Sorry. Hey, okay, I'm, I'm on to it. I'm sorry. That was one of the funniest things here. I think. No one's getting I've into politics. Ever seen. Okay, we won't, we won't talk, talk politics. politics. Well, on this note, I noticed, Rabbi, that you <laughs> you talked about the diversity in your own family, but I noticed that you also um, counsel interfaith relationships. And I just want to ask you about how you navigate that. I think one of the assumptions, because religion has played a part in the way, for a long time, the way people have socialized, that that was the connecting factor. But now, because of travel and because the connecting factor will be a mutual interest and religion isn't necessarily the core mutual interest. So you have people connecting because, let's say, they met in college, right? Like, oh, you're a psych major. So am I. We Let's get together for a study group. And then they end up becoming partners and they might be of completely different religions. I think yeah. one of the assumptions is that like, oh, no, how are you going to do that? Instead of it being the celebration of this, I think it's a very cool thing and very beautiful thing. What are some of the things that go into counseling couples of that come from different faiths? 
and it's like honoring each other's face. That's what I, I think if honestly, just as, this is my thing. If you really do value religion and religious teachings and you would be celebrating and excited and interested in somebody else's, that's what I think. And I think that's the healthy approach is to see it more like an adventure rather than a competition. And I can speak both personally. Uh, I can reflect on my parents. So my father uh, was born Jewish. My mother was born Southern Baptist. They met in college. My mother converted to Judaism. And I'm sure, you know, the uh, the mushroom room clouds over their parents' homes when they announced this would have been quite bright. But I also uh, fell in love with a woman who was not born Jewish. She was also very curious about Judaism, and she also converted to Judaism. Love has a way of bringing us together in ways uh, that are mystifying and magical. By the same token, there are those who meet of different faiths who love each other, but also love their religion and are, are, are not looking for another spiritual path to follow. And so we begin by, first of all, emphasizing the commonalities, as well as the fact that each have beautiful teachings that can't always be meshed together into one. You know, Judaism has its view of humanity and of our soul and salvation, and Christianity has its understanding of the soul and salvation. And those two don't mesh. Uh, when it gets down to that level. These are different teachings. We respect them as, we, we, we use the word different, not right or wrong. And so, you know, you have to adopt uh, a, a new vocabulary, perhaps. But this is the person you fell in love with. And this is what helped create that person. This is what this person brings to you. And so they find it, you know, they find ways to celebrate both of the holidays and do so like like Hanukkah. We have Hanukkah coming up on beginning December the 18th. And one of the neat things that has come about over the past several decades has been Hanukkah Christmas tree ornaments. Mm-hmm. You know, the Magen David, the Star of David, uh, even a Hanukkah menorah, even latkes, uh, which is a, a fried potato. We call it a potato pancake, but it's more like hash browns. Uh, mm-hmm. but fried together in, in a patty. And so there are now Jewish Christmas, the Jewish ornaments to go on your Christmas tree for interfaith families. I think that's wonderful. Yes, um, I have, uh, and, and many Christians would say, oh, that's terrible. And many Jews would say, oh, that's, well, maybe not many, but anyway, there are Jews who would say, oh, that's terrible. And there are Jews who would say, and, and there are Christians who would say, oh, that's terrible, that's scandalous. But no, it speaks to the time. Whereas religion in the, you know, 15, 1600s is what defined you as an individual, in modern times, religion is part of your flavor. It doesn't define you from the standpoint of, you know, there's more to me than my religion. And that's only a result of modern times because, you know, back in the days, that was your life. Your life was in that religious setting. And if you were not part of that religion, then you were out. Here, Spinoza turns out to be the first modern human being because he was unfortunately ostracized by the Dutch rabbis uh, of his time. His teachings actually are well respected within Judaism, but at the time they were radical teachings and the Dutch rabbis could not accept it. So he was ostracized, excommunicated from the Jewish world, and he was not accepted by the Dutch Christian world. And so he was a man who lived without religious definition and without that religion defining him, which laid the course in his philosophical writings for many modern philosophies and indeed for what has become, you know, modern life, where my religion doesn't define me. It might guide me and it gives me a path to uh, salvation and it gives me a path for celebration, but it doesn't define who I am. I find it very refreshing. When I first began my rabbinate, you know, when I was ordained in 91, I was very uncomfortable with officiating, the idea of officiating at a mixed marriage between a Jew and someone not Jewish. Why, you know, why would I do that? You know, that I'm, I'm empowered to act on, on behalf of, you know, the Jewish people. And there were a couple of weddings that I said no to that I wish I had said yes to now. Because as I grew and evolved in my Judaism and my understanding, I realized that, yeah, 
This can be a beautiful expression of love and I think is the antidote to the isolationism that exists in many branches of all religions, that we will have nothing to do with the other people because they are sinners, uh, they are wrong, they are evil. And we have that in our Jewish extremists. We have that in Muslim extremists and in Christian extremists. But this is the antidote. Wow. So that was a shift for you. You did not start out with that position. That's so interesting. Did you, do you remember when there was a moment where you, you had, like, how did you get from there? I mean, I'm wondering if there was a moment for you where you're like, I I am okay. I'm changing my point of view on this. Did something happen? Mm -hmm. Did you meet somebody or did you read something or what was that shift? Uh, it, it was a combination of all those things. I declined to be involved in a in a family member's wedding because it was an intermarriage, and I was in a uh, uh, you know I guess I was going through my isolation phase. I, I wasn't ordained yet as a rabbi. I was a student rabbi at the time, and so I was still in seminary, so still living in the you know ideal closed off world. And for a long time, you know, that, that was the Jewish stance. It was also the Christian stance for a long time. If you're, you know, not Christian, you can't marry. The, the church will not officiate. And between, you know, the remorse I felt from that and uh, encounters with couples in my congregation who were interfaith, and I could see, oh my God, this does work. And it can work very, very well. And the more that I understood that I'd rather have Judaism at the table you know, at least as part of this process of this couple's becoming, rather than not at the table, that led me to say, yeah, I started doing them. And as part of the process, I insisted that the Jewish spouse-to-be meet with the Christian spouse-to-be's, you know, religious leader, whatever that is. Your Methodist, you know, go speak to, you know, a Methodist minister, go speak to a priest. So the Jew had to do this, and uh, the Christian had to likewise get a briefing on Judaism so that it's not just we're entering this from a, a point of ignorance about our own religion, and I'm not entering it with an ignorance about the other person's religion, but I now know something about this person. And it became a, a teaching opportunity for the couple, and I have co-officiated with priests. So now I'm, I'm very active in this. It can work. And it does work if the couple are committed uh, are committed to each other. Is the historical context part of that? And the reason I'm asking is because a few years ago, I went to Poland. Um, I'm of Polish descent on my father's side. And I just remember going to Krakow and seeing, going to, visiting some temples and just seeing the plaques on the wall of this family, like, you know, 40 people gone, like just family mm -hmm. lineages, just completely gone. Is part of the reluctance for the interfaith marriage, if it's not just about religion, is it because of the historical context of families, family lineages just gone? That's a, that's an interesting point. I hadn't thought of that. That was probably my earlier thought as to why I wasn't in favor of officiating at interfaith marriages. It was, yes, to rebuild the Jewish population. But that can be done with someone who's not Jewish as part of the family if they decide to raise their children as Jews. And that's not a requirement. So I do not say to the couple, I will do this, but you have to pledge to raise your children as Jews. We do know that children who are raised in one religion as opposed to two sometimes conflicting religions, you know, at the same time, can easily identify with the other religion. So if you're raised as a Christian, it's very easy to understand Judaism. If you're raised as a Jew, very easy to understand Christianity. But when you're raised with both and some of those conflicting messages, again, about the human soul and salvation, then it becomes a source of confusion for, for children on, on a spiritual path. So I encourage the couples to, you know, look, you're going to decide your children's friends. You're going to decide what school they go to. You're going to decide, you know, what vaccinations they're going to get. This is another decision you have to make. I really appreciate your time. I've enjoyed this conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, can we wrap up with what does faith mean? And in my existentialism class, this is how we wrap up the term. We read a bit of, on the meaning of life from Camus, who's an atheistic thinker. We read a bit of Tolstoy, who was excommunicated. Um, and but but said that faith was the meaning of life and purpose, but he rejected dogma. And then also my friend Dr. Gorell's book on the gravity of joy from a theologian's point of view of what is faith. So from your point of view, what is faith? Hmm. That's a very good and very tough question. 
I would begin by saying that faith is that part of us that enables us to face adversity and challenges from a position of centeredness. Adversity is is very much a part of life for all of us. At times we have been bullied. At times we have gone through the death of a loved one. At times we have gone through a change in job, a change in financial status, a divorce, the death of a child or the illness of a child. So faith is that part of us that enables us to face the adversities and the challenges of life in a way that doesn't overwhelm us. I think faith is one of our tools in our toolbox that we can use to help respond to those painful moments. I think faith is faith is a very individual thing. I might belong to a particular religious movement, particular religion, but what I have gained from the teachings of that religious movement, what I have gained from the teachings of, of my religion on a personal level becomes my faith, which might be different from the Jew next to me being Jewish. Obviously, I'm going to uh, refer to Judaism. There are many, many teachings, many examples within Judaism, and that has been distilled through my interaction with life into a faith that I hold that might be different from the Jewish person next to me. If I were to try to identify or define that faith, how would I describe that faith? How would I define my faith? It's hard because it's so personal, right? It's like, it's it's not the same thing as just religion or outward. It's, 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 well, even once we put it into language, it kind of loses its essence because it's just, it's here. It's in the heart. Mm-hmm. I'm going to try, I'm, I'm going to play with this thought. Let's see okay. where this goes. My faith teaches me that poo-poo happens <laughs> and that the creator is waiting to see how I will respond. That does not mean that God says, you know, all right, let's zap Mark. Let's zap these people. No, life is such that that shit happens. And when it does, I feel that there is a source waiting to see how I'm going to respond. This is related to how we understand God's interaction with Abraham when God asked Abraham to go sacrifice his son. First of all, in Abraham's day, 4,000 years ago, child sacrifice was the norm. The Canaanites were doing it. People in the Middle East were doing it. People in South America, Central America were doing it. We have found their mummified children. People in the Northern tribes in Europe were doing it because we sing a nursery rhyme about a child sacrifice. So child sacrifice was the norm in Abraham's day. If we're sitting around the fire and Abraham's telling us the story, the story has a, has a much different impact. You didn't sacrifice your son? You sacrificed a ram? Ugh, genius! But at any rate, our rabbis and their commentary are perplexed by this. Because what happens is that from that moment on, when God says, go sacrifice your son, sacrifice the one you love, sacrifice Isaac, and Abraham gets up and does so without question. God and Abraham never speak again. For the rest of Abraham's life, God and Abraham never talk. It is an angel who calls out to Abraham. And our rabbis understand that Abraham blew it. That what God wanted Abraham to do is exactly what God wanted Abraham to what what Abraham did when God said, Sodom and Gomorrah are nasty places, I'm going to destroy them. Abraham says, whoa, whoa, whoa. no, 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 God, you can't do that. In Judaism, this is chutzpah, this is guts. The creation tells the creator, no, 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 you can't do that. Uh, shall not the, the judge of all ask, act justly? What if there's nice people there? It's the only place they could find a job. You're really going to wipe out the innocent with the guilty? No, 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 no. Moses does the same thing. God says to Moses, I've had it with the children of Israel. They have doubted me and backslid. I'm going to destroy them and make a people out of you. Moses says to God, bad idea. Moses says to the creator, no, you can't do that. What will the other people say? They'll say, you couldn't kill us in Egypt. You had to bring us out here to kill us. No, God, this is a bad idea. And so there is this challenge that comes out from life, just from living. Things are not always going to work out. 
And I think there is a power that is waiting to see how we're going to respond and will be able to be a source of strength through us, for us through that challenge. Our daughter was diagnosed with biliary atresia, uh, which is blockage of the bile glands, when she was one month old. The doctors told us, <laughs> we were in Cincinnati at the time, which happened to be the best place to be because Children's Hospital in Cincinnati, Ohio, was trying to get a handle on this disease because this is the number one cause of infant liver failure. And so they were studying this disease and they sent a team to Japan to learn about a procedure that a Japanese doctor had developed to try to buy time so that the infant would grow to a point of being able to be transplanted, to have a liver transplant. There is no cure for this disease. The only way out is through a transplant. And so the doctors told us if she lives, she'll need a transplant. She's 34 years old and has not been transplanted. She wow. is written up and it's one of, I do not believe God said, oh, I will save Ariel. Um, no, we were in the right place at the right time with the right doctors who performed four surgeries on her, even when they said, we don't think it's going to work. And we said, let's do it. And they did. It was because of that that enabled her. But during that wrestling, as much as I wanted God to come down and not only heal my daughter, but because of the nature of a disease, we were on the pediatric, the terminal pediatric wing where infants were going to oh. die. Mm -hmm. And shit happens. <laughs> um, as the doctors would look at us and say, <laughs> what should we do? Part of me wanted to curl up into a little ball in the fetal position and just check out. But I felt... I felt, I, no, I, I can't do that. She needs me, and I need to have an answer, and my wife and I have to have an answer. There was strength in that faith, that in, in my understanding of that faith, that, yeah, God is waiting to see what I'm going to do with this moment. And yes, I can shrivel up <laughs> and curl up into a little ball and say, forget it, but my tradition commands me to choose life. And so that's how I would understand my faith. When people often say that, well, God answers all prayers and sometimes the answer is no, I find that an incredibly cruel understanding of God. I believe that God answers all prayers. God says, I agree with you. What are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. That's how I understand the workings of God. In Judaism, we don't pray to God so much to do things. We pray to God for perspective, for wisdom. We pray to God for strength, for courage. Yes, the prayers literally say, oh God, you know, grant us peace, your most precious gift. But there is an understanding that I am part of that peace prayer and what am I doing to bring peace into the world? And so I believe that the answer to all prayers is, what are you going to do about it? Fix it. Uh, I'm here, but I can't fix this. This has to be up to you. And I think some people are terrified by that responsibility. Some people find it much easier. It's much easier to blame someone else than to acknowledge that, yeah, I didn't give it my fullest intention. You know, I, I didn't come into this with 100%. And yes, it didn't work out. And it also says, look, some things are not fixable. I do not believe in a God, as I said, that zaps people, nor do I believe a God that steps in and says, well, because you said the right prayer in the right language, using the right names, yeah, you, I'm going to help. I think Spinoza said that would suggest that God was fickle. <laughs> if, <laughs> if if you just said the right prayer, or that the reason something happened to you is because you said the right prayer, did the right thing, then that would suggest that God was fickle. And that always kind of stuck right. with me. I was like, I never looked at it that way, but I guess it does. That's a really, that's really us projecting onto what this being would be like. Exactly. Exactly. And that's something that Moses Maimonides, Rabbi Moses Ben Maimon in the 1200s was warning human beings, you can't do that. You know, you can't project onto God. I mean, you can, but then what you're worshiping is an idol. You're not really worshiping God. If you project onto God what you want God to be, instead of looking at the world and saying, you know, what is my evidence for God and what do I see going on in history and in the world, that's how I can define God more accurately. I'm really just struck with... I, I have so many thoughts. I know we need to wrap up. I'm just thinking about um, different ways in which God has been viewed and how that can actually, 
the way in which you're describing faith and prayer is that it's uh, for strength, for perspective, that it's not for some like a, a genie in a bottle to grant wishes. And that right. what can happen is that if somebody does look at God in that way and then is going through suffering, they're going to have a harder time coping with the suffering because they'll look at it as some sort of a punishment as opposed to um, poop happens. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I'm sorry. The poop happens. And, and I love it. I'm sorry. I'm in the middle of potty training my daughter. Yeah. So it's like that, that phrase just resonated with me just a little, <laughs> a little too well. <laughs> yeah, That's been yeah, our absolutely. mantra lately. Poop happens. <laughs> poop happens. Yeah. And I would agree with you as a, as a hospital chaplain, you know, I've, I've counseled with people who felt that, you know, yeah, God was punishing them. Yeah. And uh, okay. So this is their belief. All, all right. I, I think it's kind of sad. But so much happens to us. You know, we, we hear the Bible stories when we're little kids, and then we, we, we don't really revisit God, you know, as we get into the teenage years. Uh, and then a crisis happens, and we go back to our infantile theology of God. And we have, you know, a high school degree. We got a college degree. Intellectually, we're way up here. Theologically, we're way down here, and we're going, okay, this crisis happens let me turn to my religion. Oh God, that's ridiculous. <laughs> there is no God or, you know, God doesn't work instead of letting that challenge, challenge our theology, hmm. try to grow our theology and, and our spirit, our spiritual understanding. Well, thank you so much, Robert. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Good is in the Details is produced by Dr. Gwendolyn Dalski and Rudy Salo. Thank you, everyone, for a wonderful 2022 and actually great three seasons. We appreciate you so much. If you're enjoying the show and you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please scroll down to the bottom and hit that five-star review. Check us out on Instagram, Good is in the Details Pod, and go to our Patreon to join our book club and get extra content. Patreon.com slash Good is in the Details. Okay, we'll see you in 2023. Bye.